Okay, so now if uh, board members, I'm gonna call on the public comment folks and then we'll have discussion. Welcome speaker number one. Good afternoon, board. My name is Shane Gregory, and I'm here as the custodian of 43 letters that you've received over the last week or so, and I'm entering the names of the uh, authors into the record just so that the public knows who's weighing in. Uh, they come from an international coalition of concerned physicians, scientists, environmentalists, teachers, and parents. I'd like to stress that we are not against the educational wonders that are at our fingertips with new technology. Our concerns are about the, the wireless delivery of this technology. So on behalf of Cindy Sage, Dr. Martha Herbert of the Harvard, Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital, Dr. Magda Havis, Trent University, Ontario, Canada, Dr. Ole Johansson, Karolinska Institute, Stockholm, Dr. Joel Moskowitz, School of Public Health, UC Berkeley, Dr. Deborah Davis, the Environmental Health Trust, Dr. Martin Blank, Columbia University, Department of Physicians and Surgeons, Elizabeth Kelly, Electromagnetic Safety Alliance, Mary Callahan, Wireless Education Action, Ellen Marks, California Brain Tumor Association, Susan Brinkman, Center for Electrosmog Prevention, Deborah M. Rubin, People Against Cell Towers at Schools, Nina Beatty, Dr. Antoinette Stein, Environmental Health Trust, Paul Sunmark, Joshua Hart, Shane Gregory, Ray Peeler, Malini Menon, Kathleen Sunmark, Kikulani Iwata, Gail Nickel, Michelle Kong, Terry Siemens, Sharon Phillips, Linda Ewart, Citizens for Safe Technology Society, Diane Whitmire, Kim Hahn, Elizabeth Barris, Jeff and Stephanie Austin, Barbara Lasanti Mills College, Gerald Page, Beverly Phillip, Eric Windheim, Victoria Sievers, Allison Pinelli, Sue Chang, MPH, Center for Environmental Health, Mary Beth Brangan, Ecological Options Network, Colleen Gatz, Professor Nareg Spogliarch, Vasanya Spogliarch, Zulema Luke, and Astri, Astrid Rios RN. I would like you to please take into consideration the very serious health effects that these distinguished people who've taken a lot of time to write you letters, please take this under consideration. And uh, just to finish up, there's a wonderful website, Escuela Sin Wi-Fi. To quote them, Internet C, si, Wi-Fi no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker number two. Welcome. Hi, my name's Kevin Modis, and these people are going to cede their time to me. Yeah. Say your names for the record and just uh, say I'm speaker number one. My name is Casey Dady. I'm speaker number five. We're not anti-technology, anti-Wi-Fi. Lorraine Ballette, speaker number six. Very important to note that not against internet whatsoever, but against Wi-Fi, which is a very important point here. Thank you. My name is Eric Irving. I'm speaker number seven. And as, as everybody else, I'm not against uh, uh, the internet for the students. I am against the, the Wi-Fi service or wireless service, which causes problems. So thank you. My name is Astrid Rios. I am speaker number four. I am here as a parent and as an oncology nurse. And I am here against Wi-Fi. My name is Roxana Malara, and I'm here. Uh, uh, because both my parents have cancer and half of my family have passed away of cancer. Sir, so that's six people giving you the time? Mm -hmm. Is that what you have? Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Um, if you put the time on here. Thank you. Um, it says 17 minutes. 17 plus him, so. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, it's not eight, it's 18 plus, it's 21 minutes, friends. Help me with the clock, 21. No, six plus, well, was it six plus you or? It's fine. Okay, 18. Okay, then go. Um, uh, hi, my name's Kevin Modis, um, and I stand before you. Uh, the first point I wanted to make is when voters voted for uh, bond RYQ, they didn't intend for half a billion dollars to be spent on tablets. They expected it to be spent on infrastructure like buildings and things that are dilapidated. And 
uh, so people can have better housing for their schoolwork. Um, but I stand here before you, not just myself, but as a representative of many groups, many of whom the directors wrote letters today, um, but in particular, Citizens for Safe Technology, Environmental Health Trust Organization, California Brain Tumors Association. And I'd like to enter into the official record a 57-page handout I submitted in support of what I'm going to say today. Um, importantly, there is no proven safe level of microwave radiation exposure to children. And without this, we are experimenting with the health and safety of our children. And we feel this is unacceptable, especially when there is a safe alternative, and that is the wired access to the internet, the wired connection to tablets, that would avoid and put the exposure levels to levels so low that no one would have a safety concern. Especially given that we're spending $500 million on this project, we feel that the money can be spent to ensure its safety for the students that are going to be using it. Um, our big concern is long-term heavy exposure because that's the situation we're going to be putting students in. As one principal said, they will be using it for all 6.6 .6 hours of the day, and then we'll be sending them home most likely with the tablet. And given this long-term heavy exposure, there has been a very, very clear association with long-term heavy exposure and cancer. We feel that the Health and Safety Department of the district is using a cost-benefit analysis. We know they're using a cost-benefit analysis to look at this situation, basically making the life and health and safety of a children an expendable cost. And part of the cost being cancer, cardiac problems, immune system disorders, headaches, arrhythmias, and other disorders related to radio, radio frequency microwave exposure that is inherent to all wireless use. We feel that you have sufficient evidence to take precautionary preventative action to exposing these children to such a health and safety concern. As a government body, you do not need to use the same kind of measure that a legal body would need. That is absolute conclusive proof. All you need is sufficient evidence. And the one thing that is common to all the letters that you see submitted to you by experts from all over the world is that there is sufficient evidence to say it is preferable to go to a wired alternative to prevent microwave radio frequency radiation to our children. We're asking you to exercise your privilege, your right, your mandate to exercise sufficient judgment in providing a precautionary preventative uh, level of exposure. Currently, the district is using a level of radio frequency exposure of 0.1 microwatts per centimeter squared. Um, we believe this is inadequate for several reasons. First, we have good reason to believe in consulting with experts, which we encourage the board to consult with themselves, that this, this level is unachievable given current modern equipment that does not take into account or want to achieve radio frequency safety. Second, Second, and you will see uh, Cindy Sage of Sage Associates and co-editor of the Bioinitiative Effort report wanted to be here today but was unable to make it. And she uh, put in, she submitted a 20-page testimonial, some of which, uh, some of which on page five of this testimonial, you'll see three articles, four articles, Thomas 2008, Henrichs 2010, um, Moeller, 2010, another one by Thomas, that shows various biological non-thermal effects from microwave exposure well below the 0.1 level that the district is choosing and calling safe. One, these are 100 to 1,000 times lower than what the district level has chosen. Included are concentration problems, um, headaches, irritation, uh, behavioral problems in children, sleep disturbances, um, and other chronic effects. Now, this is our concern in the short term. In the long term, our concern is much greater. 
and that is the prevalence and association with cancer. If you look at page 57 of your handout, page 55, I'm sorry, of your handout, you'll see the work of Dr. Hardell, who basically has found a dose response with exposure of microwave radiation. And that is, he finds that with every 100 hours of exposure, you increase your risk of developing cancer by 4%. He also found that because of the cumulative nature of the exposure, that every year you can add 11% to that risk. So therefore, over a 10-year period, you'll be increasing the children's risk of developing cancer by 800% based on this research. Understand the gravity of this research. This is the research that the Italian Supreme Court used in ruling that cell phones can cause cancer. Part of his group, another part of his revelations in research, is that with children that started to use cell phones before the age 20, they were five times as likely to develop cancer than children who used them after that. Now, that's just starting before age 20. Now, what if we start microwave radiation exposure at age 7, say? What is that going to do to the risk of cancer? The implications are very scary, and your obligation to ensure children's safety is very real, and we're asking you to exercise it. The FCC guideline that the district has chosen, they have explained, is 10,000 times less than the FCC guidelines or requirements. But understand, the FCC guidelines are only guidelines. They are not safety standards. The FCC guidelines only protect children against acute burning. So to say that you're 10,000 times lower than the FCC guidelines means absolutely nothing, because the FCC guidelines are not seen to be protective except for acute burning. Understand also, the FCC guidelines do not cover children. It's part of the special populations that they've explicitly excluded, which includes pregnant women. Now think about our population of students and pregnant teachers and their exposure to microwave radiation and what it's going to mean for their health. Also, the FCC guidelines were designed for a 6-foot man at 220 pounds, not for a small child in elementary school. The FCC guidelines were intended to cover short-term, 30-minute exposure, and they allow that to be repeated. But it has nothing to do and does not cover long-term exposure like we're going to be covering, we're going to be exposing our children. Understand that the World Health Organization, when reclassifying electromagnetic fields, including radiofrequency radiation that's used in wireless, when they reclassified it as a Class 2B carcinogen, they were looking at a study that found an increased rate of risk for cancer of 40% with 1,640 hours of exposure, which was considered long-term exposure. Our children will have that exposure in one year's time. Your approach to let's try it and see what happens, and then if there's a problem, then we can change it or we can stop it, is not appropriate in this case because after one year's time, you've already increased the rate significantly as documented by the World Health Organization and is included in your packet. The other limitations of the FCC guideline is they do not cover non-thermal effects. They do not cover any sub-thermal effects, even though thousands of studies have shown non-thermal effects, including studies done by the wireless industry themselves. So to say that your guidelines, the exposure rate that you're choosing, is 10,000 times less than the FCC guidelines is really meaningless. And the sense of safety is just a sense of safety. It does not protect the children. It does not protect you from liability if children are to get harmed. The other concern is there is going to be no effort to look at the children's population and see what effects are happening. Even though in Austria they have developed guidelines for doctors and they recognize electrosensitivity as a real medical condition, and they have specific symptoms that could be looked for and reported back, but there's been no effort to do that. In Sweden, where electrosensitivity, that is people who become very sensitive to electrical fields, 
um, has been recognized as an official disability, they estimate that 3% of their population could be considered electrosensitive. If you look at that, those statistics, and by the way, Sweden was one of the earliest um, adopters of wireless technology. We should look at what they're doing. We should learn from what they're doing. At 3%, that's 122 122,000 students that would become electrosensitive. Are we really willing to risk this just for the convenience and the cool factor that wireless provides when we could provide a wired alternative? Um, the URS report that you've been submitted to by the Health and Safety uh, Department um, has several weaknesses. First, they only look at separate devices being tested, their exposures being tested separately. But as you heard, some of these classrooms have 20 to 50 people in them, and they don't take into account the cumulative exposure. The other thing they do not take into account, when you look at the measurements in the table, ensuring the safety of the students from the tablets, and it's the tablets that are going to be emitting microwave radiation as well as the Wi-Fi. When they look at the exposure of the tablets, they're measuring it from one meter away. Now that's completely inappropriate given that the students will not be able to be one meter away when they're using their tablet. It has to be very close. And when you eliminate that distance, the risk increases substantially. The reason we're looking at what we know about cell phones is that with all wireless devices, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's a tablet, they emit microwave radiation. And they expose children to microwave radiation effects. To quote, and while our health and safety department is very knowledgeable, are they really as knowledgeable as Dr. Martha Herbert from Harvard Medical School and from Mass General Hospital? And she says the, the following. According to Dr. Herbert, children with existing neurological problems that include cognitive learning, attention, memory, or behavioral problems should as much as possible be provided with wired, not wireless learning, living, and sleeping environments. Special education classrooms should observe no wireless conditions to reduce avoidable stressors that may impede social, academic, and behavioral progress. Now, this is coming from a pediatric neurologist. All children should reasonably be protected from the physiological stressor of significantly elevated EMF, RMF, wireless in classroom or home environments. School districts that are now considering all wireless learning environments should be strongly cautioned that wired environments are likely to provide better learning that wired environments are likely to provide better learning and teaching environments and prevent possible adverse health consequences for students and faculty in the long term. Monitoring of the impacts of wireless technology in learning and care environments should be performed with sophisticated measurement and data analysis techniques that are cognizant of the nonlinear impacts of EMF, RMF, and data techniques most appropriate for discerning these impacts. There is there is sufficient scientific evidence to warrant the selection of wired internet, wired classroom, and wired learning devices rather than making an expensive and potentially health-harming commitment to wireless devices that may be substituted out later. This is from the experts, the real experts in the field, pediatric neurologists. From Dr. David Carpenter, who's the director of public health at, Al at Albany University, he says, quote, when speaking of Wi-Fi in the classroom, human studies of comparable RF and microwave radiation parameters show changes in brain function, including memory loss, retarded learning, performance impairment in children, headaches and neurogenitive conditions, melatonin suppression and sleep disorders, fatigue, hormonal imbalances, immune dysre dysregulation, such as allergic and inflammatory responses, cardiac and blood pressure problems, genotoxic effects like miscarriages, Cancer, and, uh, cancers such as childhood leukemia, childhood and adult brain tumors, and more. This is what I'm asking you to really consider, and this is what I'm asking you to vote for a wired rather than a wireless connection because of these very, very serious, and I can't think of any more serious implications in terms of the health of the children. We are dealing with a new technology. We are dealing with a technology that is basically unregulated. It only covers burning. The FCC is full of the wireless industry. It is beyond a conflict of interest. The FCC commissioners come from the wireless industry and they return to the wireless industry. The IEEE that's developed the standards is a trade group for the wireless industry. 
We are, you are being informed regarding the safety and the safety standards for these devices from organization that is highly, highly conflicted. In the short term, we're looking, researchers report headaches, concentration difficulties, and behavioral problems at the levels that you are choosing here at the district. And sleep disturbance, concentration problems in adults, as well as headaches. In the long term, we're increasing the children's and the staff risk of cancer by an estimated 800% over 10 years and 80% over one year. I ask you to at least consent, informally consent your parents about the evidence that is out there regarding the health effects. Con provide them a formal consent that we're going to be exposing your children to a class 2B carcinogen classified by the World Health Organization. Tell them about possible symptoms so that when their child gets sick, they know it's not just something they ate or something genetic, but it's something that's very controllable and preventable, and that is wireless radio frequency radiation exposure. I think parents deserve at least a warning and education since there's so much ignorance around this topic. In, the experts in looking at the research use a weighted approach, but understand that on the other side of the weight of studies that are being done by independent sources are the wireless industry funding their own research, paying their own contracts, and focusing information and education on the part of the information they want to provide. Mr. Zimmer, you are fighting very hard in the Pacific Palisades to keep the DWP substation from being near Marquez Elementary School, one of the reasons being the RF exposure that may be caused by this substation. And now you are talking about taking that same radio frequency radiation exposure and bringing it into the classroom knowingly and doing it in a very industrial strength type way and doing it in a very comprehensive way and exposing the children in a very long-term way. A long-term way that if you look at the studies, look at the studies on page 51 from Dr. Hardell, you will see has been well associated with cancer. And if you look at on page 55, you'll see the brain tumor, information about the brain tumor registry. The wireless industry wants us to believe that cancer rates haven't, haven't increased. There are references to the brain tumor registry that shows brain tumors have increased about 20 to 40 percent in populations under age 50. They group them all together to try to minimize the effect. But the effect is real and you need to look closely Thank and you. protect our children. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Board members, that concludes the public speakers. Ms. Gallatson, on this item, ma'am, we, on this item, no. we're. We're only, we're, we're not done yet. We're aggressive, but not that aggressive. We are on <laughs> item, I believe it was um, 12. Thank you very much, of course. Ms. Gal Gallatin? Okay. I just want to thank everyone that worked really hard on this. It has been about a year and a half of us trying to craft this. And, and I do want to point out um, to my colleagues and to the parents and teachers and principals who are here, who are watching, um, we don't have the answer to every single question that's going to come up. Um, some need uh, an opinion from Sacramento. We need, um, we don't know all the answers yet to how, um, how we're going to roll this out. A and that's one of the reasons why I think very smartly uh, the superintendent and his staff recommended doing this in phases. So instead of how the district usually does business, which is, you know, everyone's full speed ahead on this issue, and then we realize, oops, we wish we would have done it that way. Th this time we're, we're doing them in, in phases, where we have a, a relatively small number of schools, a good cross-section of schools um, are going to try it out. We're going to try out different devices. We're, we're really going to figure out what issues come up. Um, as we've seen in, in a few of the schools, some of the issues that come up aren't even things that we thought about, uh, about recharging uh, devices and about locks on doors and about all, all sorts of things that we didn't see. And then as soon as the school started getting devices, we're like, oh, yeah, we need a way to plug in 35 devices overnight to recharge them and stuff like that. So, so I think that's why we're very wisely going um, 
moving um, with alacrity, but also doing this in phases so we can work all of the bugs out early um, and develop a really high quality proposal um, for all the kids in this district. So I'm very excited about this. I, I think we're, we're handling this in a very um, responsible way. I'm very excited about what this is gonna mean for, for my children in the district and the, the rest of our um, children in LAUSD and uh, I urge you to support this. Yes, uh, since so many allegations have been made against the, uh, the, the district, is there someone from environmental who can address these very quickly? Well, my name is John Sterrett. I'm the director of the Office of Environmental Health and Safety. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, you want me to talk about what we've done or do you have any specific questions you'd like me to answer? Just very quickly to address some of the allegations that were made here. Uh, the, our position is that there, the Wi-Fi exposure, uh, the program that we're implementing, uh, the work that we've done, the research that we've conducted is that the district is doing this in a safe fashion, that there, you know, there are some allegations about exposures, but our research and our, our position is if we follow the guidelines that OEHS has put forth related to the Wi-Fi equipment and the tablets, uh, we can do this in a way that benefits the educational direction of the district and also assure the safety of our students and staff. You know, I know these have been used uh, all over, everywhere. So is there any record of a, a problem like this occurring anywhere? Not to our knowledge. There are folks out there that have done studies and made recommendations about exposure, but as far as uh, a direct correlation or a direct relationship, uh, we're not aware of that at this point. Thank you. You. Mark okay. Hovatter, please. Um, I I spoke with Mark before because I had several concerns, and, and one was, uh, you know, we lose books at about between three and seven percent a year. You know, just do. So I I asked Mark, uh, and I'm I wanted him. He gave me an answer that I I can live with. Uh, one, we lose the books, so we lose. Uh, lose the, uh, I, whatever we buy, probably in a similar number when you're dealing with thousands and thousands. Also the breakage factor, uh, what are we going to do about that and how can we replenish them? And then the, um, the issue of who's going to continually repair them, because uh, uh, my method of repairing them doesn't work. That's when you kick them and you shake them and, <laughs> and it doesn't work. Once in a while for me it does, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't work. So w without putting them on the spot, you can just validate what you told me, and, and that was one. We're going to look for contracts that account for breakage for lossage uh, and are replaced. And number two, that we may float the idea of, you know, in high school we offer electives in computers and things, and maybe some of the youngsters uh, – can uh, get certified, and that's a career path in and of itself of computer repair certification, and they can assist because I got to tell you, it's just like years ago when I was skiing. Uh, I learned how to fall down. That was a basic thing in skiing, snow skiing. But when the little five-year-old passed me up and yelled, on your left, I quit at that moment. So <laughs> that's the same way with computers. Uh, uh, I asked my children, how do you turn it on? How do you turn it off? And, and they know everything. So, uh, Mark, I just wanted to let everyone know those were the answers you gave me, and I felt very satisfied. Was I just wanted to validate that. That's correct. If the board approves this, we'll be in a selection process. Uh, immediately we'll go out for a competition. And one of the things that we have considered as a critical factor is the usability of these devices and the proposers that come up with the system that allow us to continue to use them through theft, through breakage, through any other events and allow them to be quickly replenished if we, there are other, they're going to be the ones that score the highest. That was all, and I just wanted the public to hear that because we have, yeah. you have thought about that issue, and that was a major concern as I go. And, and as Dr. Dacey so eloquently told me this morning, uh, this technology is not the end. It's a tool. And so whether the computer itself or the iPad or whatever we call it, 
gets a little old, it still provides the access that we need, and that was his point. So I think that's important also. So thank you. Is it possible to get a, uh, a list of the uh, specs that are being put on the RFP? It, yes, sir. We'll make sure that's available to all the board members before we release the RFP. So the, the board will be able to have a chance to go through it, and if we have suggestions, you can either accept them or not? Yes, sir. Uh, relative to the comments made by the last public speaker, uh, is uh, an R, R, RF emissions or any kind of radiation uh, limits on the on the uh, uh, iPads, part of one of the specs is there? Yeah, our Office of Environmental Health and Safety has come up with the standard that we are going to publish as a minimum requirement. Anyone who does not meet those standards will not be allowed to propose on our system. Okay. And one other thing, in terms of the uh, the loss, um, we're going to have tens of thousands of kids walking to school or walking home uh, with these iPads. Now, I don't think many of the kids get accosted because somebody wants their textbook. <laughs> but when the, one of the reasons for loss is, uh, you know, is robbery, um, is, that, is that something that will be covered by this same insurance policy? That the requirement will be that there'll be uh, the replacement of the tablets regardless of how they came to be lost. Okay. I'll have some more questions in a little while. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Zimmer. Um, I have uh, a couple of questions for, well, uh, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Snare. If at any point in the future, I mean, I assume that we're going to be tracking and monitoring. I, I mean, I, I read your informative. We're clearly aware of the concerns that folks uh, have raised. Uh, these are not new. The, these are concerns that are raised about Wi-Fi in, in all public places. I, I understand that there's a higher concentration in a classroom, but certainly um, private schools are way ahead of us in, in certain affluent districts in this in the state, th this has been done to make sure that um, all students have access to um, tablets and other types of, uh, of laptop devices. But I'm assuming that there's going to be ongoing monitoring. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, sir. We've uh, worked with the Ron Chandler and ITD. We've allocated necessary resources and funding, and we've got a plan as far as uh, doing evaluations at the school site uh, ongoing. And if levels that have been discussed reach any type of even danger indicator, I, I'm assuming you'd come immediately back to the board and that uh, there would be some kind of, um, you know, we would work out some type of alternative plan uh, for, you know, making sure that our kids have this access to technology even if, you know, some of, some of what's been brought up did turn out in the future uh, to pose what you believe to be an actual risk to our kids. Absolutely. Just like any other safety exposure, if we determine the risk is increased or if there's research out there, information out there that indicates a problem where the federal regulators or state regulators change the standards, uh, yeah. there's an evaluation and a follow-up, and we treat this just like any other exposure that would be something we'd look into. I thank you for, for what you do uh, every day. You really do a great service to this district. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Aquino. Um, in the, in the last meeting, we talked about um, uh, professional development, and uh, you've, you've uh, I like the outline that, you, that you've presented. Um, we have some just great model schools here. Um, I did not expect that there would be a, a full rollout of a professional development plan today, uh, but I w I'm interested in your comment. I, I'm just kind of your thinking about how we're going to use our model schools and the great um, kind of uh, initial successes we see here. How are we going to leverage um, our model schools to inform the professional development at this first group of pilot schools, the first group that we roll out? 
that's one of the reasons why we are doing phases. So phase one, where we will inform our practices in terms of the lesson learned around professional development. But I also want to remind the board that as a system, we are well versed and experienced in terms of doing professional development at large scale. So let me remind you that any time that we do an adoption and we have to distribute 300, 400,000 textbooks, we have to train our teachers and our staff. So we will apply the same protocol and system and having this phase one will, will inform us. We do have several subcommittees that have been working on developing the detailed plan. One of them is on the professional development. Um, and how are you, for these, for these demonstration schools, I mean, the anecdotal evidence and the evidence that you're collecting is, you know, I think it can look pretty in depth. Are, is it, are we going to evaluate? Are we going to have an outside evaluator? How are we going to kind of do the evaluation piece? I, I, I understand that, that may not be completely thought out yet, but what, what are the initial thoughts and conversations on that? So we have had conversation, looking at, at Matt Hill, we've had conversation um, as recently as yesterday after we had an industry forum as to whether we should uh, set aside for an external evalu evaluation. Um, I just want to remind that in phase one, the evaluation will be more about the implementation, not necessarily about achievement results, because in that short period of time, you might not see necessarily that that impact. But we do want to see some of the. Well, uh, and, and so you'll report back to us on that. Yes, and, absolutely. And, and, and of course, we're also we're talking about bridging a technology gap. So yes. I mean, there, there is, and, and but of course, we 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 want to make sure as we're preparing for the Common Core, we want to make sure that it is a preparation that is completely holistic and not what we saw today is certainly evidence that could happen. Yes. Um, I'm just interested in you getting back to us and kind of what what's what's the plan yes. for, for So out. the superintendent has been clear that in the fall when we come back to the board we will have a full report about phase one before we go for approval for phase two. Yes. Hey, Dr. Aquino, yeah. so I remember when, you know, we said 160 schools, but we ended up at 131. I want you to figure out plan A, B, and C, A being the fastest and when you come back for phase two, because uh, I understand we have to go to where the, gr the need is greatest. Um, and I am supportive of this because I hope, like our building program transformed LAUSD, I am hopeful that this program also transforms instruction. And I'm expecting that instead of 48% third graders reading at grade level, we're going to get to the 98%. And I'm expecting that we're going to move from the 64% to the 94% on graduation. So we're closing the digital divide, closing the opportunity gap, and we are absolutely going to see more success in our schools because this district is moving into the 21st century. That's Thank you goal. for all your work. Thank okay, you. board members, if we could... Any, I, I have my hand up. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Ms. Lamont. <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, Dr. Kino, you heard one of the speakers indicate that he had not anticipated his money going for tablets, but rather for construction. So I think it's really important that we get the community and the parents involved in whatever we do uh, in terms of uh, professional development. The parents have to understand the importance of this, and they need to be included. So um, hopefully you will do that, and the RFP will go district-wide, and it won't be to somebody we don't know, but to give our people an opportunity to make to, to uh, bid also. Yeah. Uh, so actually that question was posed yesterday at the industry forum, and my response was that the RFP will ask the potential uh, provider to describe what their approach for parent and community engagement is. So yes. So looking here at the uh, timeline at phase phase one, and it says that from uh, July to August, uh, the staff will get the devices and training. 
Um, are they going to come back during the summer? Or are they volunteering? Or? So in terms of our, uh, a couple of things. In terms of our timeline, we're looking at a couple of options. So one of them would be there's a pupil free day at the end of the, of the school year, whether in these schools we could do that. Um, or we will ask the, the staff to, to be trained in the summer and they will be compensated. Anything else? Uh, yes. So I wonder, is the lady from 54th Street School still here? Just left. Unfortunately, I wanted to ask her a question. What's going to happen when the once the kids get the iPads? Do they are they have we determined whether they're going to be able to take them home yet, or is that still something we're wait, we're waiting for news from Sacramento? So. So first, I just want to reiterate that we're using the word device. So <laughs> it's not that we, no decision has been made as to whether there's going to be an, uh, a, an iPad. I know that sometimes it becomes synonymous, but uh, we want to be true to our RFP process and go with the, uh, the, the proper bidding process. Uh, right now, phase one, the devices will stay home. We continue to work with Sacramento. Stay at home or stay at uh, school? Stay, sorry. <laughs> stay at school, sorry. <laughs> stay at school. Uh, we continue to work. We continue to work with Sacramento um, in terms of looking for a solution that hopefully will address that. But in phase one, right now, until we don't have a, a solution, they will remain in, in our buildings. Will the staff be able to? Uh, Take them home. Uh, bond council is looking in terms of that. Okay. Okay. My my question actually I was leading to, assuming that that things work out so that the students can take them home. Uh, are they going to keep the same uh, same tablet? Uh, from one semester, one school year to the next. When they go, when they turn them in in June, will they get the same device back in September? So that's part of actually one one of the technical subcommittees looking at that. I don't know if Ron or Matt want to talk about that. So I can have Mr. Chandler come up as well. Matt Hill, Chief Strategy Officer. One thing we're looking into purchasing is a learning management system as well as mobile device management. So in simple terms. Each student will have a login. All of their information will be downloaded, available, so that any device that they have. So it not necessarily has to be on the device. It's going to be in the cloud, the information that they need. But if you're in the same school, obviously, we're going to have check-in, check-out. Um, we're going to explore that in phase one. What is the easiest way to progress it? But for sure, all students will have their identity with all the information they need so they can log in on a device. And if they have access at a library or access at home, they can access some of the same content. Is that, I didn't see that anywhere in the budget about cloud storage. Well, it's, it's called learning management system and mobile device management. You'll see, um, we have two line items for that in the budget. Okay, I thought I'd seen that. Slide 22, I believe. Okay, I'll, I'll look okay. at that in a bit. Uh, when all the tablets come back to school, once again, assuming that every student has one, how is the district going to store 650,000 tablets for the summer? Well, I think that's uh, also the same, the same way that we store textbooks. But that's, pla that's part of what we're looking into in, in phase I, one. I repeat my comment. There are very few times that people have broken in and to steal textbooks. But we're going to have all of these units basically on, as I understand, on racks that so have wheels. And 30 of them at a time or 50 of them at a time can be rolled out the back door. So I, I want to quote Ms. Gallison because she made a comment earlier that when she was speaking to the audience that we might not have 
all the answers to the question. That's why we're doing phase one. One of the subcommittee that we have is on safety and security, with which we have our chief, uh, Superman, right. uh, has been involved in terms of looking at the best practices. So this is an initiative that is cross-department. So he has been leading and looking very carefully at what some are some are all the best practices. And we will work with the places like Advance that already has been implementing and the schools in the phase one in terms of what works well. Will the safety and security solutions be paid for out of bond money or general fund? So in phase one, we do have a part of this program, the security analysis that's gonna provide support to the team. In addition to how the devices are going to be secured, there's actually a best practice where these carts are locked into a wall. You have to rip out the wall to get access to these uh, machines. Um, but we're also working with LAPD, LA school police about the monitoring and the support that we're providing to our schools when the devices are there. Okay, my, my question had to do with bond money or Right, so the bond dollars. Fund. So as far as the security plan that we're developing, the support, that is part of the initial phase, which is bond dollars. As far as the patrolling and the monitoring of that, that will be part of our operating expense going forward. From general fund? With our existing school police, yes. Okay. Any other comments, questions, board members? Any uh, questions, objections? Uh, not? Yes. Oh, okay, yes. roll call vote, Mr. Craig. Thank I, you. I, I would just like to make a comment now that I've finished the questions. I, I have kind of a unique position here, having been the uh, IT director for the Pasadena School District and facing many of these same issues as we were rolling out computers to all of the classes, uh, as we were setting up internet and trying to keep it filtered. I haven't actually addressed that with the questions today, but uh, in terms of safety, it's not just the safety of the child walking home with a, uh, an, a, a tablet uh, in his hand, but it's the safety of the child when he logs on to the computer onto the internet and is faced with uh, several choices that uh, we wouldn't, certainly wouldn't tolerate if the child were in school with a computer in terms of uh, pornography, dating, uh, selling things, buying things that uh, uh, are illicit or illegal. Uh, there are a lot of issues like that. I know the district has a filtering system. If I have, a, have my iPad, pardon me, if I have my, well, it is an iPad. Uh, <laughs> if I have my iPad here plugged into the district network, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, there's a filter. Uh, my, my guess is that it's a, it's a filter that keeps me out, but my, my guess is it's probably two weeks until the, uh, till the students have figured it out. Uh, we, we actually have, I'm, I'm proud to say it, uh, two high schools in uh, district, board district five, uh, two high schools that are in the uh, finals for the uh, Cyber Patriot program where they're going to be rewarded for hacking into computers and defeating the security systems. So, so these, these issues are issues that I, I, I'm concerned about calling phase one the time to deal with those. I think many of these need to be dealt with before phase one and we're getting ready to spend what will ultimately be not a half billion dollar project, but by the time we get the security in place we get the wiring in place, uh, we get the Wi-Fi in place, assuming we are satisfied that the Wi-Fi doesn't pose hazards, we're gonna be closer to a billion dollars than half a billion dollars. And I think it's a disservice to the taxpayers who voted for uh, Proposition 30 when we have schools that have windows that uh, don't open or close, where we have paint that's peeling off the walls uh, I just, I, th I think that we need to be more considerate of that. And if there was something that you'd like to comment on, I'd be glad to hear your comment. I didn't mean to ramble. Okay, 
Okay. Um, so you can follow up, Mr. Kaiser, if, if uh, we can have Mr. Mr. Chandler follow up with you directly. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. On this item, Mr. Crane, can you call a vote, please? Tab 12, Ms. Gallatin. Yes, vote. Mr. Kaiser. I'm going to abstain. Ms. Lamont. Yes, vote. Ms. Martinez. Absolutely, in the name of my Artez students. Yes, vote. Dr. Vladovic. Yes. Mr. Zimmer. Yes. Ms. Garcia. I'm a yes. Item passes. Okay, very good. Board members, if we can go quickly. Do a great